We've been in the Red Letter uh, series, and we are again today. Summer series, Red Letter Summer. And this sermon is entitled, Looking for an Ear. Let's pray. Lord, it's been a beautiful day. We need rain. We thank you for every drop. We thank you for the beauty of the baptism. We thank you for the beauty of Sabbath. You are the great giver of all gifts. And Lord God, as I approach the Garden of Gethsemane, I ask that you would, would through your Holy Spirit empower me that it would bring honor to Jesus. That we would learn more. And through your word and through Jesus, those red letters in that dark time, may we hear you speak clearly to each of us individually and us as a church. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, um, I have a paper towel roll. A lot of damage could have been saved if my friends and I, when we were little, could have always had paper towel rolls handy. I don't know what it is about us boys, but sometimes we are inspired for sword fights. And I've noticed that paper towel rolls are a lot nicer to be hit with. And, and it would always start out as good fun, and then it would escalate. I was thankful because I always had long arms for my age, which gave me a better reach. But we would try to find swords, and thankfully our parents didn't allow it. Our, I wouldn't be here today. A lot of people wouldn't be here today. We'd have all been dead. But we found the next best thing. We would find branches. And branches are not as smooth of wood as a paper towel roll, nor as gentle. How many of you men did sword fights with sticks and limbs? And then the fight would get worse. If you found a bigger, thicker limb, you grabbed it. And then the screams of pain. Usually it'd start with the fingers as they were crushed and splintered, followed by elbows. When dancing in strange languages unknown to man would be happening as you danced your way around in the sword fight. And if you were fortunate enough, a mom was somewhere nearby and she would yell out the window, Drop your swords. And while you were not afraid of another human being, well, moms are human beings, let me take that back. While you were not afraid of any other man, moms brought a whole other level of power and authority to the game. And you would stop mid-swing if you were wise and drop your sword. All VBS has been about allowing Jesus to help power us through. Well, today we see one of Jesus' biggest, toughest disciples, and I wish my VBS friends that he had lived your motto in the Garden of Gethsemane. For a lot of people would not have been hurt as badly if those disciples had been listening to Jesus and praying for him to power them through. So today, we find ourselves with Jesus looking for an ear. I, it's found in all four Gospels, Gethsemane, and you can look it up. It'd be good for you to read it. You'll get different angles, the Holy Spirit working through different disciples. You find it in John 18. You find it in Matthew 26. You find it in Mark 14. It's interesting. We always call Mark the Gospel of Peter because we believe he is the one behind that. Maybe someone had to help him write. I don't know if he was good in school, but I noticed there it doesn't say who was the one with the sword. I'm just saying. And it's found in Luke chapter 22. So we go to a garden. I'll, I'll read two of the sections, and then I want us to try to prayerfully relive that night, those moments, and what Jesus has to say, not for Peter or any of the others, because they are dead and gone. So Jesus put it in his word, and by the way, the Gospels were some of the last books of the Bible written. So this, so this isn't written for good old Peter, James, and John's sake. This is for us. 
And Jesus has something to say to us. We'll take a look at John, and we'll take a look at Dr. Luke's take on it, and I'll probably bring in things from Matthew and Mark as well. John 18, beginning with verse 1. I'm reading through the Bible right now in the ESV, so that's what I'll use here. If I slip into King James, sorry, it's just my second language. Here we go. When Jesus had spoken these words, he'd been trying to get through to his disciples all through the upper room. He'd been warning, he'd been warning, nobody's listening. They're all telling him how it's going to be. Disciples across the brook, Kidron, where there was a garden, we know from elsewhere this is Gethsemane, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place. For Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. There's going to be a fight. Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? Take note of this, because we have gone through a lot of sections of John in this series. They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am. We know he's masculine, so we put the he on there, but in the Greek it is just the two words, and you know by now that Jesus is doing something more than just saying he's from Nazareth. He says that title of divinity, I am. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am, so I know that I'm not making this up, something happened. When Jesus said to them, I am, they drew back and fell to the ground. This sounds so nice and gentle. But the feeling in the Greek is they got knocked back and down. And there's reason. He asked them again, whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus answered, I told you that I am. So if you seek me, let these Men go, the good shepherd. Even when he is going to be smitten, he is still looking out for his sheep. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken of those whom you gave me. I have not lost one. Then Simon Peter, John's not as gentle, he points him out. Having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant. Now, in the other gospel, you'll hear that, that Peter said something before he struck. He said, Jesus, shall I strike with a sword? But obviously he didn't wait for an answer. And none of us here have ever been guilty of asking God something and not really meaning it. Asking God something and not waiting for the answer. But if you've been someone like me and have done that, how often and how well does that work well? Shall I strike with a sword? And obviously Peter was better with nets than he was with a sword. He struck the high priest's servant. Now I always felt like this poor guy. Do you ever feel that way? Poor Malchus, what's he got to do with anything? He just has to be there. He's the servant of the high priest. But here's what you need to know. High priests weren't out there. Sanhedrin people weren't out there. It could be dangerous. You let other people go do your dirty work. So you send your servant, and out of all the mob, he would have been the one in authority. So he would have been by Judas, and he was there, and that's why Peter, the closest guy to him, he's taken him out for God. Because what do you do to God's enemies? You kill them. 
I don't know if he was trying for his head. I thankful he just took his ear. Can you imagine if he took his head, Jesus having to put a head back on? Jesus said to him, but this is more authoritative, and this is a command, put your sword in its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me, which he'd been praying about over and over again, and ending each prayer with, not my will, but thine, and he has taken the cup, and he will go to the cross. Dr. Luke, let's see the physician's angle on this through the Holy Spirit. Verse 39, he came out and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him, and when he came to the place, he said to them, go snore a bit. You guys are getting used to me. It's not in any translation, not even a paraphrase. He doesn't say, go snore and sleep well. Pray that you may not enter into temptation. He withdrew from them about a stone's throw away. Stone's throw away from the stone, Peter. It's kind of nice. Knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, see, when, this is the difference with Jesus. When Jesus says, but, it's in surrender. When we say, but, it's in our own will, right? I'd really like to do that, Lord, but. Jesus was, I really don't want to, but, Son of Man, Son of God, absolute surrender. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven. And if that angel hadn't come, I believe Jesus would have died there. Strengthening him. And being in agony, this is the doctor now, right? You don't get this with Peter. You're not even getting this with John. He prayed more earnestly. His sweat became like great drops of blood down to the ground. And I have never been in anguish like that. And I thought anguish could kill me. And when he rose from prayer, he came to his disciples and he didn't find them praying. Found him sleeping for sorrow. He said to them, Why are you sleeping? Rise and pray that you do not enter into temptation. Now, in the other Gospels, you'll find that he came to them three different times, and then he says, it's time to get up. While he was still speaking, there was a crowd, and a man called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. Out of all the things that happened to Jesus that night, out of all the things that happened to him that weekend, I have got to believe that this had to be about the most painful thing that took place because nothing hurts more than someone you love betraying you. Isn't that right? While he was still speaking, there came a crowd, a man called Judas, one of the twelve leading them. He drew near to Jesus to kiss him. Jesus said to him, red letter, Judas, would you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? Just like Pharaoh, long before him, he hardened his heart. Be careful of hardening hearts. They are dangerous. When those who were around him saw what would would follow, they said, Lord, shall we strike with a sword? And one of them struck the servant. How nice. And you know who? The servant of the high priest and cut off his, we got detail, this is a doctor. Right here. Doctors need to do that so they sew things up on the right place. His right ear. But Jesus said, no more of this, exclamation mark. His strongest words were not 
to those people coming to take him, it was to his closest disciples. No more of this. And he touched his ear and healed it. And here Jesus says this, and it's written in numerous Gospels. Jesus said to the chief priests and the officers of the temple and the elders who had come against him, have you come out against a robber with swords and clubs? When I was with you day after day in the temple, you did not lay a hand on me, but this is your hour. And it all starts to come together, doesn't it? We saw him at the other festivals. He's using I am statements. He's saying, I am the bread of heaven come down. I am living water. I am the light of this world. I am, I am, I am. And they wanted to kill him. He said, before Abraham was, I am. And every time they wanted to kill him, it would say something like, his time had not yet come. And Jesus would say, my time has not yet come. And now in the dark of the garden, he looks at them and says, the hour is now. Do you know how much the devil had power over that crowd now? Go back here to John 18. When they ask, in the, who, where, who is Jesus of Nazareth? He said to them, I am. And, and what happened here was, I think God making a statement to the mob. You see, out of all that time, with all that humanity wrapped there, a tiniest particle of divinity at that moment when he said, I am, like at the burning bush in the wilderness with Moses flat on his face and his sandals off, who will I say sends me? And he says, I am that I am. Not I was, not I will be, always. That's God. Jesus was God and man. And you know what I think God the Father was doing? Watch this. Tiny speck of divinity show. And those men, they didn't just, oh, let's go back and fall down. It knocked them back and down on their corrupt keisters. Is that, is that okay to say? Their corrupt keisters. I think God the Father wanted them to know that you are not taking my son. He is going of his own accord. If he wasn't willing to take this cup, you couldn't lay a hand on him. In Matthew, he says to Peter, oh, th <laughs> he's got his sword. And, and he says, shall I strike? And, and, and Jesus says, stop it. Don't you know that I could ask my father, and this is kind of cool, if you've studied anything of Roman Empire, and he would send me 12 legions of angels. Now talk about overkill. But in the empire of Rome, they understood 12 legions, didn't they? But he's not talking about, you know, I mean, Rome could send their stuff. That's what God is saying. You could send all of those Roman soldiers you wanted. If Jesus wants out, nobody can touch him. You realize that we couldn't look on God, could we? If he wanted to show his divinity, you better not be looking. Moses, oh God, show me your glory. <laughs> I love you too much, Moses. So what I'll do is I'll take you, I'm going to put you in the cleft of this rock, you look straight into there, I'll let my back, I love this, how do you put it into human language, pass by you. And there he is, crowded into a crevice, and the glory of God goes past him, and it has such an impact that even his face glows. So when that crowd came to take him, God said, there's more going to happen here. Jesus said, I tell you, I am. And at the moment, he uses that title. That mob, and I think Judas too, went down. Now, how do you do this? Then Peter comes in. Let's watch it in slow motion. The mob comes. Jesus has been saying pray. Too late now. God, he's been praying. Last time we found, he said to Peter, Satan has demanded you. 
but I have prayed for you. When you turn back around, when you come back toward me, strengthen your brothers. Don't you love Jesus? Aren't you glad he prays for us? So now, he says, I am, and just the slightest hint of divinity shines through. And it was a dark hour because that crazy mob, how would you like to have been the one, okay, now it's my turn to go put ropes on this guy. But before they can get to him, Peter lashes out. I'll die for you. Yatcha! Missed. I got an ear. And before he swings again, this is what I'm seeing, Jesus goes, put away your sword. Now, I want you to try to imagine being those disciples. Because I'm thinking, Peter, what he's going for, I'm going to get the first guy. We'll, we'll make a scene. It's dark out here. They've got torches. But if we run into the dark, you'll be saved, Jesus. Let me save you, Jesus. You ever try to save Jesus? Please, I've got enough problems. <laughs> Swings it. Now, I don't know. I've tried to imagine. Heaven, we'll find out. And at potluck in heaven, you can say, well, you were off. But two of these gospels said it cut the ear off, right? Now, I know, Jesus, if he wants to heal an ear, if it's flapping there, sorry if you're squeamish, but if it's flapping there, just put it on. If it's off, pick it up. If you're Jesus, maybe leave it lying there, have another new ear. But this is how I see it, because... This isn't about the mob. This is about Jesus giving another lesson to his disciples before he dies. And Peter's like, what are you doing, Jesus? What are you doing? And, and I just see Jesus, because he's this way, down on the ground saying, I'm looking for an ear. Put away your sword. I'm looking for an ear. There it is. Now, if you've ever been cut bad, and I'm not going to talk about blood because some of you will pass out, but if you've ever been cut bad, you know there's some shock that goes with that, especially if it's really sharp. You're not expecting it. You go, right? I'm thinking Malchus is grabbing on in a bit of shock, holding that ear where it was. And Jesus comes to him, and, and, and he didn't say this, but this is what he's saying, because you know a lot of communication isn't what's said out loud, right? They're going to tie me up here quick. Move your hands away. It's not going to hurt. It's going to feel real good. By the way, I'm not just Jesus from Nazareth. I got a bigger zip code than that. His enemy. And Peter's got to be thinking, how can I help you, Jesus, if you keep putting parts on that I'm taking off? I mean, what, if I take his leg, what do you, how can I help you, Jesus? Put away your sword. That's how. So as I'm going through the Bible, you know, maybe God doesn't do this to you, but he steps, i got flat toes. I'm thinking maybe what he said to Peter is what his message needs to be to his disciples more than ever before. Put away your sword. This is the age of the sword fight. This is the age of hate. And I'm not surprised the world has that. I just don't like seeing it in the church. You know, it's like, you can feel like when you go anywhere nowadays, it's like the evangelists of this age are news anchors. Don't watch the news too long. You'll be wanting to swing a sword. I mean, it starts stirring me up. 
But Jesus, I think, is saying this. How will they know who I am if they can't see me in you because you're acting just like them? He said it nicer. I'm a Halverson. And I'm not sanctified enough yet. I mean, you think this is your kingdom? Now look, you know, you can tell, I'm a patriotic American, glad to be, concerned deeply for my country, but I will not forget in this day and age with all the craziness that I'm a citizen of another kingdom. And my zip code's not 93288. It is, but it isn't. Maybe 777... Imagine you just cut the guy's ear off. And instead of escaping, Jesus is looking for it. And you're thinking, that's your enemy. That's our enemy. What are you doing, Jesus? I'm looking for an ear. Well, isn't that just like Jesus? I wonder what that crowd thought later when Jesus went to the cross and then on Sunday morning they look in the Jerusalem Times and said, tomb empty, Jesus gone. Because they saw for a brief moment just a hint of the glory of God shine through and they felt the power of God. They were the face of God. But Jesus had said to them, it's dark out here. My time has come. This is your hour. But aren't you glad this world has got the hour? But Jesus has eternity. So here's the assignment this week, class. Privately, I want you to hear Jesus say the words to you, put away your sword. And I want you to prayerfully be honest before God and recognize what that sword is. And then what I want you to do, and I'm going to have to do this too, is let go of the sword. Maybe you're like me. Maybe you've got you know, multiple swords. Maybe you're a ninja. Maybe you've got a sword collection. But I want you to hear Jesus this week say, put away your sword. And then I want you to not just let something go, I want you to pray for something. I want every one of us this week, every day of this week, to pray, Lord, give us, give me and give us the fruits of the Spirit. Give us a bumper crop of the fruits of the Spirit, because that way, those outside these doors will see a difference. And they'll know that we're not just asking them to come into a vegetized world. But we are different. And this is where you find love. And this is where you find healing. And the reason you find that here is because we are Jesus Christ's disciples, and that's what his kingdom is about. So you with me? Drop the sword and pray. Amen. Lord Jesus, I think I'd been right there with Peter. I, there's no one like you. We, our politicians ask us to trust them, but they've not been trustworthy ever. Don't let them take our attention too much. People hate him. Social media. Let us not be like those who are cruel. Jesus, we are in a world of hate and a world of swords. And i got to tell you, Jesus, I would rather die like a lion than a lamb any day, but if you call for it, I'm going to let go of my sword. Fill us with your spirit so fruit starts just growing in us. May we read those fruits. But in your power, I ask that you would give us those fruits. And I ask it, Jesus, in your saving name. Amen. Amen.